every now and again, when you get an introduction that's really, really good, you don't want to read because the introduction <laughs> sets the work up so nicely, you suddenly go to the bar. <laughs> and, and we talk, but thank you, Jeffrey, that's, that's great. Um, it's good to be here, especially, I'm getting my voice print because I just walked in, I, I was drop, dropped in the wrong place and I had to cross town very quickly. And I tried to hail a cab. No. <laughs> Don't you have the app? What do you mean the app? <laughs> anyway, here I am, I'm a little bit late. I caught the last two or three hours outside there. Thank you. You're doing great work as a poet and, and as a critic. And when you mentioned the Blue Mountain, where I've also been, it was like, you know, home from home. And you got Chinese in the audience. I didn't just call Jamaica home. But what I meant was, if you're from the Caribbean, you have to go to Jamaica. It just generated reggae and everything else. The whole culture when I was growing up in London was a Jamaican-led culture. And then you had to say, I'm Guyanese, I'm Trinidad, I'm Barbados. But it was led by Jamaica. And we trusted them. <coughs> oh, you're here. <laughs> Sorry. There are people here I'm seeing now. If anybody's hiding who knows me, put your hand up so I don't get surprised by this. <laughs> yeah. but I'm, I'm just relaxing into the room because literally it's jitter, jittery. I got in, got dropped, ran, stopped, hailed cabs, walked backwards, and then here I am. Um, Denise and I have not seen each other for a long time. I think since the late, I'm going to age myself, but late 80s. Um, London was a ferment at the time of readers, black writers, feminists. We were all together trying to make beat Thatcher. <laughs> it was very hard. <laughs> it was very hard, but it was a good fight. In that, poetry was aligned with not just history, but politics. And it was an interesting time. We took it for granted that the politics and the history would intersect. Um, if anyone said aesthetics was somewhere else, we always told them, are you kidding me? Where, where are you from? So we tried walking from here to here at 11 p.m. And that's the, there are parts of London where it's a woman or a black person, you have to be very careful walking those places. And so when you wrote about the, the city, the city was a, not a psychogeography or a romantic engagement, it was literally a negotiation of space. And your A to Z was like, you know, will that bottle be thrown at me or not? So the poems became political, not because you even could choose it. You just wrote because you reported what was going on. And then it became rarefied into an image, a memorable phrase, a beautifully broken line, and so forth. Which is me saying to you, this book, it's a long segue, <laughs> to say to you that my writing, if, it, if I'm called a political poet or an identity poet or whatever it is, I would dare you to take me into a surgery and separate my aesthetics from a historical landscape that's symbolic and everything else. But to make the argument, you rely on good critics to say that and to say, look, of course he's into a good line, a beautiful image, a character, a voice that can't be distilled anymore because it's refined. But there is also this thing that made him, a city that made him, <coughs> from which he's, he's come out of, some music that he listens to repeatedly. So this is my statement to declare a kind of politics, poetics, aesthetic, and say to say to you, you cannot unplat them. It's a loaf of bread. You've put them together. You've baked the bread. Now undo the plats. You can't. Well, you can if you really mean. <laughs> I've seen people try, you know. Okay, <clears throat> my voice is ready for the room. <laughs> I'm now I'm pretending to have converted when I tell you this, because I, I teach. I do workshops. I believe in the poem as utterance. We leave our quarrels outside so we can settle some things in the room, in the so-called, not workshop, but in the gathering. So I do have these moments when we say, well, that line is a bit awkward, or that image is a bit stale, I saw it in the Six Book News, can you do something else with that? So there, I, 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 I've made a statement about politics, but I'm also acknowledging that there is an aesthetics to what I do in the repeated return to the same space, a blank page, a phrase in my head, a line from Bob Marley that means something 20 years later that it didn't mean 20 years ago, and I want to capture the distance between the two as an act of my own maturation, stuff like that, you know, it's still going on. I might, I might write a bad poem about today, <coughs> trying to get here in Manchester, I'm trying to ask people things, and they said they turned away from me a couple of times, they thought I was threatening. I'm a poet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, I'm good. 
and thanks to Karkonen for, for this book, it's a beautifully produced book. This is the first image of a, um, a moving image ever taken. The jockey happened to be black, and that wasn't important at the time. And it, I think he had several cameras that he took stills of over 50 yards, and then he put them together to make the very first moving image. Uh, I was interested in, 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 of course, it's a scientific breakthrough, but that the black he was black wasn't important to the science, the scientist. But at the time, black jockeys were prevalent in America. They won every single race. And then Jim Crow came along and said, no, 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 we can't have black jockeys fronting American horse racing. And they got rid of them all. And so overnight, if you look at the, the say, Kentucky Derby, if you've heard of a Kentucky Derby, in the 1890s, 80s, you'll see a lot of black winners. And then suddenly, no, no jockeys are black. And they were literally removed from the landscape, told to go away, and were forbidden for coming and, and racing. So, but before that, this jockey, in my book, in 1850, the, the most important race that happened in the West um, was, was, was race in, in California, Los Angeles. And there were two aristocrats who owned all the land going up to San Sacramento and down to San Diego. That's a lot of land. If you try and drive that landscape, it's about an eight-hour drive. They owned everything, and they had two horses. One horse was known as Sarko. It had won everything. It was a horse that was built to kind of pull buildings down. It was amazing. And so he said, I'll take anybody on, any, any bet you like, any wager. So I'm telling the backstory because once I start to read, when I say horse speaks, I'm not even going to explain to you. I'm not going to be the horse. But let me tell you the background. So Sarko is the big horse of the day. And then Pico, who is the other land, landowner, and they're like this, as billionaires always are, they're always arguing with each other. Um, he said, I'm going to race you. I, I got a horse coming from Australia. Back in those days, the horse took a long time to come across the sea. When the horse came off the ship at San Francisco, it had lost almost half its body weight. And when people saw it, they laughed. They said, you're going to use that horse, it was called Black Swan, <laughs> to race against Sarko? People then bet their houses and their estates against the horse winning because they were so sure nothing could be done about it. What they didn't know was that in Australia, Black Swan was the horse. It was the horse. So by the time it got here, it was emaciated. It came off the, down the gangplank, as we did during the Middle Passage. <laughs> by the way, if I say horse and I say black jockey, in 1850, both were classified as stock. You had a horse, you had a cow, you had a black person who was enslaved. They were all classified as stock. So when I, caught, when I have them talking, someone said to me once, Why, how can you have a horse speaking and you have a black person? Isn't that undignified? I said, you know, you studied American <laughs> history at all to know how far we've come. Because this is exactly what's going on. So when they're speaking to each other, they're speaking against a kind of colonizer who came and took over the landscape, cleared it of, indi of the indigenous and laid down a system of extraction that we have today. So the, the book is really about going back to that moment in a, in a way to speak to our present, our modernity, and to show what it owes, you know, where, it, where its roots are. Um, I tell you all this because when I start to read, I will not explain anything. So you would have to guess he's a horse now. No, he's the black, the black jockey. No, he's the moon. Oh, I thought if the, if the moon can, if, if the horse can speak, why can't the moon speak? Then I thought, if the moon can speak. And so I've got some voices in here that are kind of inanimate objects and so on. And then I realized, after I wrote it, I was trying to write an encyclopedia for a planet that might disappear. By sheer default, it's a green book. So if you're a green person, you're saying, Fred, I've only got 50p, and I want to buy your book because I believe in green, I will put the other monies to, I'm not saying that, no. I'm not saying that. But it's a green book. So by default, it's a green book. So the politics I'm saying to you is behind the aesthetics and behind the obsession. <laughs> That's enough. I feel like I've arrived in the room. I set myself ahead of myself and I've caught up with myself on here. <laughs> okay. Call, call and call. Call and response is very big in the Caribbean. So. Call. We gather for him, hundred st strong choir, cathedral, bell, tongues. 
dance troupe at traffic lights break out on red in the middle of the road. Stadium, where beats rock, young, middle, old. Bring him back from dead to long, raise him, claim him from some unknown grave that kept him lost in history. Stranded outside time, banned from his name. Calling, come back now for us who need you more than you should know or care. You seem big to us, time chained to your skin, skin stretched by our summons, summons fused to your good name. You cannot be us, your cord blood for ours. If we find your name buried in your time, if you answer us from your bed of skin made by history for us to sleep in, that keeps us awake. Called. This is where you get your full name. Match your race fame. Make history yours. No fanfare of drums, procession of dancers, released white doves or shaman canticle, just weeds of words gathered by hook, dipped into a sea, folded like a book with you lost there until we fish you out for a second look at what history took for too long gone, and so as good as dead with nothing left and nothing said. BJ, black jockey, looks back. In my game, if I glance round, it's to catch how much more dust I need raised to blind the field trailing in my wake. I may have been beside a river in a charitable little tent when I fell out my mother, grabbed my first hungry breath. I dreamed of a palace on a hill overlooking sea, full ships, docking riches, jumping fish, handed me spoon-fed gold platter, or a farm deep in country, fenced by forest, stream, mountain, no barbed wire or weapons, wheat, grain, sky, heavy with fruit. Blues so sweet, sad that deep cut I welcomed, neck bared for warm blade of that flood, swept me up, off. I'm told I looked small for my age, quick, strong, show me anything once, I would show it back at twice the speed. I moved all the time, walked fast with a bounce, nickname hurry up man. And what I know from that time, confined to skull, kicked by a horse, I whipped on a ride in a bad mood. That horse waited for me to pass behind it, and bang, me out cold for two days. I woke without my name or my past. I learned from what they told me about our plantation and cabin that someone owned me. I swore to buy myself for my sanity, took horse kick as sense knocked into me to take notice of my escape. I prayed for speed, horse brought power. I asked for strength, horse snorted, pawed, nodded, <coughs> horse. Let me stand in stirrups as I held on for my life until we crossed the line after finish line first. I'm not reading everything I've marked. I mark things in case I lose my way, so don't be worried. Dancing Saltwater is an indigenous horse trainer. They're called, um, there's a group of people, the university is built on their land, and we have a sign that says, this university is on the unceded territory of the Gabalino peoples, and that's all they're gonna get from us. Here's another brackets. Um, dancing saltwater. More of the life of a man on the run, less of his sins from his time with a gun. If you know better than you be the one to judge if what I did you would have done, don't say one word, just think it through. What in this time is a person to do? Surrounded by folk who buy up and outsell humans as stock, seen as two-thirds people. Landed wives cleared with cannon and rifle by picking off tribes by waving a Bible. God's chosen on earth to spread. Civilization among ungrateful, primitive First Nations. All of my words channel through me. None of what I say is sorry for history. 
BJ Black Jockey Dreams. In my dreams, I fly across deep blue on the back of a horse with wings for hoofs. And all I have to do is hold on for dear life, breathe at this speed. We leave sparks in our wake, seen as shooting stars. We rest as moon is to earth, as fish is to sea, so horses to me. Moon one. Count yourselves charmed. I cover ground you walk. I bathe your skin, glaze your eyes. Liquid light my way behind your eyelids, under your tongues, nails between blinks, so that what I do stands for what you think. By you, I mean all things, bipeds, quadrupeds, hills, valleys, towns, city, lakes, even the wide mouth sea. Black Swan speaks to the black jockey. The black jockey's not there, but he's talking about him. First, he walked beside me. Next, he ran with me as much as he could keep up with his skinny legs and narrow chest. As I cantered, more sauntered along to allow for his pace. Then, he sat on me in the stable and combed me busily, as if he thought I might buck and kick him, his meek frame outside, flying into the rafters or worse, out the top of the roof. I sent him a message through my black skin to his. The message said, do not fear me, black man. I mean you no harm. We have a race to win and there is only one way to win it. At this point, I felt this quiz in his interest through his skin, him asking me how in static, jumping from him to me. I said straight out what we must do. Black Jockey speaks. If I become you, and you become me, you would know my life born into slavery. What a privilege for a horse. Welcome to days on the run from slave catchers, dreams to cross the Atlantic in reverse, untangled knots of tides. Turn my life on this continent to free among equals, break the chains of my people. I see my life as a horse. You as me and me as you, one being mixed from two. Aware of despair, we keep a smile, a touch of what people might call style. Crumbs, we eat the same corn. You prefer hay? I can't stomach that, though I chew bits of it to settle my stomach and keep my teeth clean. Did I just confess that? You make me speak my mind like only my Ethel can. Not even your trainer, my friend, knows this about me. That my junkie ambition is second to none, not even Ethel and my race included. A couple more. Moon two. I say I when I mean we. I speak for the sun who lost their tongue, ordains to speak when this human run at time on earth is done, which should not be long, as the crow flies, as the earth turns in its star urn. Black Swan, the horse, speaks. And you, black jockey, get to eat hay, walk on all fours and carry all and sundry on your back. <coughs> Folk see you and want a taste or better feel of your power between my legs, between their legs. If I may phrase it the way people declare, <clears throat> when they sit on my back and I gallop for them and my pace travels up my legs and spreads through my body and they feel this charge of my muscles, like no feeling they've known bigger than the best of their lives, big as anything, asleep. They dismount, giddy, <coughs> need, brimful, as they take a part of me with them under their skin, in their muscle, that travels to their hearts and minds and instructs them, I believe, about horses joined to humans, one inseparable from the other, bonded by a current that keeps our lives afloat, until they bet on a horse and switch to seeing us as easy money, ditching wisdom about us and them, with my hide, hoofs, mane, trust me to win this game. Here is a 
this is a, the race takes, takes place and so forth, and there's some backwards and forwards between people and so on to build up to this big race, which is run. And then Black Swan looks back at the endeavor. Those days, I narrowed my eyes, lowered my head, stretched my legs, breeze freed me from the grip of earth. I weighed next to nothing. My skin listened for him on my back with his light touch of my reins. His legs trembled towards the end. All that sweat made me worry he would slip clean off me. I prayed he would hold on. He prayed I would not falter and fade. Our trainer prayed for both of us. Has L.A. seen anything like it since? I should know from where I sit, looking down on lives, running into each other, not checking where they run. But so it seems from up here, where we move without moving. <coughs> where the race is not to be won, not even run, in a time outside of any clock I know that measures these things deep inside my bones. I go by my luck at my place among stars for all time known to the living. I dream about our big race and about him as I fly in my condition of thinking, always stretched across the sky at the head of a herd.